Okay. When is okay? Yeah, no, I was trying to reach this. I mean, read that at the same time. It's not unmuting. Start video. Okay. Oh, there I am right there. Well, I should I should mute myself. Yeah, mute. Okay, not getting this. Hey, welcome everybody online. Just a heads up, we are streaming live on YouTube already. So anything that is said will be going out to the public and also saved to YouTube for the future. Uh, we will remain muted here in the boardroom until a couple of minutes before the meeting. If you need anything, go ahead and message the host in the uh, chat. See if we can help you out. Thank you so much. I'm muted, aren't I?
I'm showing off my band aid. <laughs> it's a badge of honor these days. It is. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. Something to be grateful for. Exactly. Best <laughs> words, yes, grateful. <laughs> is my volume adequate for you to hear? Yes, it's fine. Okay, good. I was a little uncertain. I have uh... 2 p.m. I'd like to call to order the Forest Reserve District of Kane County Finance and Administration Committee meeting of March 23rd, 2021. Do we have attendance roll call, please? Go, go to our, guys, go to our YouTube channel. Berman? Berman here. Davist? Davist here. Ford? Here. Roz? Roz here. Iqbal? Iqbal present. Leonard? Leonard here. Strathman? Teppi? Teppi here. Caius? Caius present. Do you have a quorum? Very good, thank you. We have the uh, minutes for approval. So move. Do we have a second? Leonard, Leonard second. Leonard second. Uh, roll call, please. Berman? Yes. Davist? Davist, yes. Ford? Yes. Cross? Yes. Dickball? Dickball, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Strathman? Teppi? Teppi, yes. Okay, they're approved. All right, on their um, item three, public, public comments. 
We have a list of those that uh, would like to speak uh, on item 4-B. If there's anyone that would like to speak on something other than that, we can speak now. Uh, those for uh, item 4-B will speak uh, at that point in the uh, agenda. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on another subject at this point? Seeing none, we'll move on to item four, our reports and presentations. Item A is a presentation of our 2020 campground season report. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear Hi, me? Hi, John. Okay. Yes. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, th this is a, I wanted to present the uh, 2020 uh, campground, annual campground report. I just want everybody to be aware that uh, unfortunately this year, you know, with the uh, COVID crisis, uh, we were not, we, we normally open on May 1st. We were not um, able to open up until May 29th of this year. So we missed the Memorial Day weekend, uh, holiday weekend for this year, so, uh, or for 2020. So uh, I think we'll see, we'll see the, uh, see that in the report as we go through it. Um, I'm going to abbreviate this because I know uh, we've, there's a lot of topics to cover today. So um, first off, I want to uh, start with the Paul Wolf Campgrounds. The Paul Wolf Campgrounds is located up in Elgin uh, off of Big Timber Road, just approximately two miles uh, west of uh, Randall. Uh, the Paul Wolf Campground was established in 1981. So it uh, is going on 40 years old. Uh, we also did a campground expansion at this uh, particular campground in 2011, which we doubled the sites um, to accommodate the, uh, the customers. Um, so Paul Wolf Campgrounds has 89 improved RV sites uh, with electric and water hookups, five ADA um, accessible RV sites, 10 primitive campsites uh, with ADA accessible tent sites. We have two of those also and five equestrian campsites. Um, Paul Wolf uh, is incorporated within the Burnage Forest Preserve also, so it's one of our uh, bigger parcels. Uh, attractions include there nine miles of trails, catch and release fishing on our two fishing ponds. Uh, it's pet friendly and it's close in proximity to, uh, to Chicago. We, um, with the campgrounds, you know, of course, the weather uh, always has, has a part to play in how many campers we get and, uh, and how many visitors uh, throughout the season, uh, depending on the weather. So. For Paul Wolf, the precipitation was fairly normal throughout the 2020 season uh, compared to 2019. Um, we'll go to the, oops, hang on one second, I'm sorry. Uh, next, please. Uh, the occupancy, the temperature trend for uh, Paul Wolf was uh, was about the, about the same. Also, um, we had uh, June, August, and September compare were a little warmer than uh, 2019, um, according to our records. Uh, we uh, we try to keep track of all the all the the weather uh, at each campground for the season and uh, precipitation. Uh, that kind of gives us an idea of uh, what we're looking at as far as uh, occupancy numbers and and uh, and revenue coming in. Um, the Paul Wolf weekend occupancy trend for the six-year comparison um, up in June, August, September, and October. And of course, we had nothing to report in May. So, uh, so the revenues were down in, in that month. Next, please. Uh, the, uh, as far as the revenues are, or the uh, comparison of the monthly averages uh, occupancy, as you can see, we, we maintained uh, basically the same throughout the season, except for a few of the, the weekends there that uh, had the holidays and also the, uh, the weather um, playing a big part in this uh, for us. And uh, so as in September, we had 68% uh, um, occupancy at the Paul Wolf campgrounds, which is real good. The rest of them were, were somewhat average and except for May. So, next. The uh, Revenue comparison. Bear with me, please. Revenue comparison, uh, as you can see, uh, we were we were up in all the years, all the way back to 2015, except for uh, two 2020. 
uh, where we had a decrease of 16% uh, just due, we feel that it's due just to the missing the uh, most of the month of May and the holiday weekend, Memorial Day weekend for, for that month. Next, please. Uh, the year monthly occupancy comparison um, for September, we were up uh, in October, we were up also. Uh, we found that, uh, that these areas, everybody wanted to get out of the house through this pandemic. And uh, it, was, uh, it was really, really strange this year trying to operate under those uh, restrictions uh, set forth by the uh, state uh, as far as uh, keeping our social distancing, which we could do in the campgrounds. But it was also uh, uh, the attendance and uh, everyone trying to work out of the, uh, our campground attendance offices uh, keeping the safe distances and putting up the barriers and what have you. So um, I want to accommodate all the, all the staff that worked very dil diligently uh, throughout this whole process, trying to get everything um, up and running for the season because it took a lot of work on their part, um, trying to scramble to get things done in a short amount of time. Uh, the daily comparisons, um, as you can see, Thursday through Saturdays are our busiest um, throughout the campgrounds. And that's, that's always been, been the norm for us. Um, and during the week, uh, it, it always stays pretty much the same, um, except for, you know, when we have the, the rainy periods. Next. Uh, the holiday um, occupancy comparison. Um, Columbus uh, weekend holiday was, was a pretty good one for us this year at 85%. Uh, and uh, the rest of them were, were, were up. Uh, this year, but uh, it, it fluctuates throughout. Um, so the, as we can see, we had nothing for Memorial Day weekend, but the years prior, um, we, we did very well on Memorial Day. So we feel that our revenues would have been up probably better than what they have been in the past uh, if we would have had May this year. Next, please. Uh, for the resident versus the non-resident, uh, we saw a, a change in this this year um, for the Paul Wolf campgrounds. Uh, we, we think it's just because of the local people wanting to come out and camp, get out of the house, get the kids out of the house uh, so everybody can maintain their sanity. And uh, also we've got, uh, as you can see, the residents were at 60, uh, 61% um, versus the non-residents, which is uh, usually we're running 50-50 um, throughout the years in the past. Big Rock Campground. Um, the Big Rock Campground was opened um, in 2013, um, this took uh, kind of the place of, uh, uh, for some of the folks that have been around, such as myself, uh, we had the Bliss Woods campgrounds years ago, and then we had the Buffalo Park campgrounds, which we had, uh, had uh, unfortunately had to shut down because of the flooding issues up in that area um, throughout uh, numerous years. So the Big Rock campground was established in 2013. It has 96 improved RV sites, six ADA accessible RV sites, nine primitive sites, and four equestrian sites. Uh, we also have the 10.3 miles of trails uh, there at Big Rock Catch and Release Fishing, and it's also pet friendly there too. Next, please. Uh, we'll go through the... Uh, this is just a precipitation trend for, for this particular one. Uh, we keep track of this, as I mentioned, uh, throughout, the, throughout the year. Um, th this one here, we saw a little more uh, precipitation uh, down at the uh, Big Rock Campground. And uh, it was just one of those things, the, uh, it just changes from one end of the county to the other. So we saw a little more down there. And the, uh, the, the weekend, uh, next please, sorry. Uh, the weekend temperature trend was uh, a little warmer also down there, which, uh, which you know, it's, uh, if the people have their air conditioners in their RVs and their campers, and, uh, then they don't worry about it. So it's the tent campers that uh, normally want to stay away when it gets that hot. So um, weekend occupancy trend uh, for there, the weekend uh, Thursday through th Saturday, uh, average at 37% capacity, uh, where the other days uh, average around 15%. Um, and then the, we had an increase in monthly occupancy uh, every month, except for uh, May and August for Big Rock this year. John Davis here, sorry to interrupt, but- That's all right. Uh, could you just refresh my memory? Which year was it that we last adjusted our rates? Oh, uh, that was in 2018. 18. Yes. And my point is that we, I believe the numbers will bear out that we did not scare people off. It was a, it was a thoughtful and 
relatively, it was a fair adjustment. And yeah. Yes, it was. According to, uh, we, we did a study on that and we do this every year. Um, we reach out to area agencies uh, to see what they're doing with their campgrounds and uh, to see if they're increasing their rates. And uh, since, since 2018, uh, the majority of them have not increased any of their rates. So we, we have chose not, not to go that route or at least recommended that to, to, to the committee. Um, for the six year revenue comparison for, uh, for Big Rock, uh, as you can see, we've, uh, we've made, made money every year there, except for 2020, of course, it was down by 6%, which is, which is not bad at all. Um, considering, um, we, we actually thought maybe we'd do a little, a little worse, uh, with the pandemic. We weren't sure what the, uh, customers were going to do this year. So, next please. And then here's just a, uh, uh, chart of the yearly, uh, the six year monthly occupancy comparison. And uh, it, it stayed relatively the same. We've, we've gone up um, uh, th this year, we went up in uh, September and October, as you can see. Uh, next, please. The six year daily occupancy. Um, you can see the Thursday, Fridays and Saturdays, just like Paul Wolf are, are the busiest for our campgrounds at Big Rock also. Next. Uh, the weekend occupancy comparison um, to years in the past, uh, as you can see, we we, we do all right. Um, it's just that we missed out on Memorial Day this this year. So um, for Big Rock, also we thought maybe we would uh, we would have done a little better, but uh, without that data there and and nobody showing up um, for the almost full month of May, I don't think we did too bad. Next. Uh, the same with the uh, resident versus the non-resident comparison for the Big Rock campgrounds. Um, the residents were up this year uh, by 12%, which is uh, pretty uncommon for us. Uh, but uh, I think everybody, as I mentioned, wanted to get out of the house, um, get out and enjoy what uh, the Forest Preserve District has to offer. Next, please. So for the 2020 uh, total revenues, uh, the total revenues are 320482 with our total expenses of 219, 092, and the net proceeds were was 101,390. Uh, we were down from uh, from the year prior, but uh, we've we've explained that. Um, as far as the revenues versus our expenses uh, for the campgrounds uh, this year with the COVID crisis, we we depend on our campground attendants, our part time. They work throughout the season. They come from the Southern states, uh, the majority of them do. Um, some of them are elderly, um, have underlying health conditions, but they do a fabulous job for us. So this year we uh, try to make up the difference. Uh, you'll see Paul Wolf campgrounds, the expenses there uh, were down this year. Uh, we can attribute that to the, <clears throat> the age differential between Big Rock and uh, Paul Wolf uh, with, with our campground attendance. Um, and also the expenses for utilities were down uh, uh, due to the efficient efficiencies and switching our utility provider for um, Paul Wolf. Uh, we saw the utilities go down there also this year. Uh, this is the combined campground revenues and expenses. So um, this just kind of lays it out there for uh, the 2019 versus 2020. And these are some uh, pictures that uh, we've taken throughout the season um, in different areas. This is a primitive campground. Um, we've got some pictures of some campers there. Uh, we've got the kayaking at the at Big Rock Sigler Lake, uh, which uh, everybody refers to as a quarry. Um, I've been here since 1991. I started my career at the Paul Wolf Campgrounds uh, as a site uh, resident there. Uh, I was the assistant campground ranger. And that, that picture that you see in front of you now are the campers that were lined out the front entrance of the Paul Wolf campgrounds. And then the picture on the bottom is the traffic backed up along Big Timber Road, just getting in on the first day. We have never seen that in all of our years of, of working at the Paul Wolf campgrounds to the point where the Gilbert's police had to come out and, uh, and kind of roused us a little bit because we were causing traffic issues with all the campers trying to get in. We were moving as quickly as possible, but with the COVID restraints, uh, we, we had uh, some problems getting the, people's check, getting, getting the people checked in and keeping the safe distance. So we were trying to move them as fast as we possibly could. But that was, a, that was an unusual site. And then the rest of these are just, uh, just some pictures that we have taken uh, in the campgrounds throughout different 
times. Uh, got a young man there, or these two gentlemen. Whoop, there we go. Sorry. Uh, these two gentlemen, uh, we, we set up at different uh, different venues. Uh, I believe this one was uh, down at one of the uh, camping shows um, and uh, the, at the Sugar Grove Corn Boil. So we, we try to get out to these areas there and uh, try to promote our campgrounds, which is uh, always well received. More, more pictures of our campers. And then we, uh, we also have a campground satisfaction survey we hand out um, uh, throughout the season. Uh, they're handed out at the campground attendance offices and they're also available online. Uh, we did not receive as many this year as we have in the past, um, but uh, as you can see, the, uh, the overall um, overview of the survey, we're not gonna go through each slide because it's quite lengthy and there, there's a lot of information there. But the bottom line is, is that uh, people uh, truly enjoy our campgrounds. Uh, we have excellent ratings with our customer service. We also have uh, excellent ratings with our cleanliness. Um, our staff takes great pride in the campgrounds uh, throughout the season. And it's not just the, the people we have managing the campgrounds, but it's the, the staff all throughout uh, that, that take a turn in uh, keeping these uh, campgrounds uh, presentable um, and uh, keeping the customers coming back. Does anybody have any questions for me? Just fine job, John. Things are looking good. Guys. Uh, Sorry. Guys. Okay. Yeah, John. Uh, I guess we never hit a hundred percent on the uh, the camping. I, I think the highest was eighty nine percent or something like that. Yeah, eighty nine percent overall. Um, that, that's um, sites uh, occupied. But we do we do get times where we are completely full. So if the people check in, they check in. They can stay two weeks um, at a time. But when they check in, sometimes we we do fill up. But then uh, the the people that are registered, you know, are are going to be leaving within a few hours. Uh, so it huh. it's it's usually not very long that that we're full. But we do fill up. Sure. Yes, we have had experiences where we've had to close the Paul Wolf Campground, especially during a beautiful holiday weekend, because it's. Full. We hit our capacity. Yeah. So that's great. But the one thing I wanted to note here too was it's important to realize that we have a northern campground in Elgin and we have a southern campground in Big Rock. And the reason we show you all the data is we've been tracking the data for years. Weather is so important to our campgrounds and the occupancy and the weather can vary greatly between the north end of the county and the south end of the county. Um, additionally, we track the occupancy from various years so we can. Um, look how that plays into our financial report. So if you look at the memo when you have time, you'll see so much additional information in there on our financial comparisons. We look at our net profit margin um, compared to our expenses against our revenues. And what's interesting is the reason that the campgrounds came in short of revenue this year was simply because of uh, not being open in May. So most people were doing staycations this year and, and vacationing local if they could get out and do anything. And like John said, once the campgrounds opened up at the very end of May, we were experiencing the numbers we had in years prior. So we're excited about 2021. We've got the state information that indicates that campgrounds can be open. So we will be open May 1. We're expecting a lot of our local families to continue to camp local. And I think that's just going to uh, increase the amount of revenues that we come in, that come in um, for our camping operation. The other important thing to note is a lot of our camping expenses are getting the facilities open and then closing the facilities down. And then the expenses in between those two are driven by the occupancies and how many um, supplies are used and how many staff are needed. And that's directly relative to the amount of campers that we have. So interesting when you look at the uh, net profit margin for Paul Wolf, um, for the last five years, it was 45%. This year it was 46%. So even though we weren't open up the majority of May, we still hit the typical profit margins. When you look at Big Rock Campground, because it's only been open for the last five years, um, that's the only data that we have. And the first year we were open, we operated at a loss. And so if you were to take in that loss year out, our profit margin would have been much higher, but we were experiencing about a 14, 14 and a half percent profit margin. This year was 9%. Guys, again, go ahead, give me a comment. Again, because we weren't open in May. So 
Um, I encourage you if you have time to go through the larger report because I think it provides you a lot more financial information. Um, but thank you to our staff for being, doing a wonderful job. Obviously, the public surveys that we get that we send out directly to our users are, are indicative of the amount of attention and service that our staff provide. Does, and the second question was the, the net profit. We're sh are we shooting for a, a net zero or the uh, whatever profit net profit we make, we what, do they go to the you general wanna, fund? You want a higher profit margin you go to, against your expenses. It goes to the general fund, does it? Or for, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, good job. Looks like everybody was having a great time. Very good. Thank you, John. Any other comments? Thank you. Uh, John should stop letting the, uh, his, his in-laws fill out surveys and then we'd hit hundred <laughs> percent. I think I'd probably have to pay him to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Our uh, item number four B is a presentation by our King County Sheriff Hain for the potential integration of the Forest Preserve Police Department. Sheriff Hain. I take my mask off if there's no opposition to that. So um, what I've learned is that this is a very polarizing topic. And uh, unfortunately, with like Monica, Monica has said, every time a, a force reserve police chief retires, uh, she feels like she has to address this with whatever entity is in, in place at the time. Historically speaking, uh, previous sheriffs uh, have, have come to the force reserve and said, look, we'll do this for you, but we're going to charge you basically your full budget and we're going to eliminate all your staff. Blair, you can go ahead and click through that one. You bet. So the reason why I put this presentation together is because I was requested by some board members to take a look at this from a financial perspective and an operational perspective. I don't think anybody else in the room could be more like Switzerland and neutral than me when it comes to this, because look, my office gains absolutely nothing from this other than more work and more weight on our budget. So the model that we put together, and one of my conditions is no full-time officers would lose their job. That is number one most important to me uh, with the Forest Preserve. Number two, that community service factor that those officers, officers represent and the knowledge of the Forest Preserve um, and uh, their, their operational conditions and the, the different ordinances that they, that they enforce within those zones. Go ahead, Blair. You can click through that one one more time. So the primary concept, or I should call it the original concept, would be uh, with the retirement of their chief, uh, we would absorb that position with our commander of public safety. Uh, the part-time officers, this is one proposition, could be eliminated if some officers need, are needed to, to stay on staff, by all means, retain some part-time officers. But then just understand the savings would decrease from there on a sliding scale, depending on how many the Forest Reserve would retain. You click through one more. The sergeant position, I would suggest shifting that to a lieutenant position for administrative purposes. And again, uh, overseeing the, the regular staff that the Forest Reserve would retain. And of course, they would report directly to uh, the Forest Preserve administration. Go ahead, Blair. One more time. So just a quick summary on the payroll with the elimination of that chief's position in the budget and the full elimination of part-time officers plus a slight increase in that sergeant's pay to lieutenant level. Uh, your, your bottom line, if you flip ahead, Blair, just under 275,000 just in payroll savings. Again, that's a sliding scale if you retain some of those part-time officers. Go ahead, Blair. Go ahead. Now, what we did here, we set this model with the Office of Emergency Management when we absorbed them with the county. So our mission at that point was much like this. We were asked to take a look at it. What could we do by absorbing that entity, that independent office of the county, under the sheriff's office? The biggest savings and the biggest duplication in the budget was operational costs. So our proposal would be to absorb all of these operational costs, including overtime. Um, you see the other nominal fees in there, telephones, supplies. Uh, we have budget discretion to be able to, to support them in that. If you go ahead, Blair. 
Hey, Blair, can you step back one? I, I want to point one thing out. One thing that uh, is a large budget item that would have to remain in there is that $39,000 fee to CaneCom, since we would still be handling calls for service within the forest reserves. Okay, go ahead. You can click one more time. Oh no, keep going. You got to fill up all those cutouts. So again, everything you see redlined out here would be absorbed by the sheriff's office budget. Of course, we have our own fleet garage. Um, one more click, Blair. We have our own fuel station and fuel carts that we can support the forest reserve operations with. And uh, we would just suggest an additional 15,000 or retaining 15,000 for uh, automotive equipment. I am also offering to assist with re uh, replacement of the forces or police vehicles as they come due for, uh, for that replacement and service time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. So total annual savings between operations costs and payroll costs, your maximum possibility is just under $500,000. Of course, we have to go back to, there could be some additional operational costs associated with part-time officers uh, that could also fall on that sliding scale. But we would have to see what the, the preference of the, the force reserve is at that point. Go ahead. Of course, the future, police reform, talking about body cameras. Sheriff's office already has our body camera contract. What we would suggest is just absorbing uh, the force reserve officers under our contract, providing them with five additional body worn cameras. Uh, and our, our cloud service, along with the camera itself, would be covered by that contract. Standalone force reserve is looking at somewhere between twenty-two dollars to $25,000 annually to, uh, to begin their body camera program, just based on our uh, leasing example. Go ahead, Blair. Can't quite see it there, one more click. You see that uh, the force reserve lieutenant would fall right under the public safety commander in our organizational chart. So for purposes of this discussion, we want to make sure, and I get to this point later, that the force reserve maintains, would maintain operational control of their police staff. They're simply under the sheriff's office for budgetary and operational support. Go ahead. Just a quick snapshot of calls for service and the overlap between the sheriff's office and the force reserve now. That left bar, of course, is 2019 and 2020 columns. That left blue bar is total calls for service. The orange bar is force reserve re police response to those calls by units. And then the gray bar is sheriff's office response to those same, call same calls by units. So you see that we're sending more units than the force reserve currently is to calls for service in the force reserve. Go ahead. These are calls for service outside of the preserve that Force Reserve Police assisted with. You see the, uh, the blue bar is in the preserves, the orange represents outside of. So uh, there was discussion of an audit being done on Force Reserve Police activity. This would, something, this would be something I suggest to take a look at as far as indemnification and liability for uh, their operations outside of uh, their jurisdiction. Go ahead. You can click all the way through that and blur. So of course the current model is most times there's two force reserve police officers spread across 550 square miles. And understandably that can make response times somewhat difficult if we're depending on force reserve police alone. So you see the response times on the left of the force reserve in minutes and to those same calls in the force reserve on the right by the sheriff's office. So we, uh, based on our patrol setting and the amount of deputies we have on the road, we can get there in less than half the time typically. Uh, our deputies also receive monthly training in stress-induced and de-escalation exercises. Uh, this reduces the use of force incidents, increases our deputy proficiency, and enhancing public interaction. Some of those intangibles other than reducing use of force incidents. Um, but uh, these offerings would be made available to the existing forces or police officers if they were absorbed by the sheriff's office. One more click, Blair. And one more click, keep going. You can just pop all these up as we go. So we do currently work together with the Forest Reserve Police on a regular basis. We, uh, you know, our patrol staff considers themselves to have an outstanding relationship and vice versa with Forest Reserve Police. And it's one of those things that when it comes internally to me and intrinsically to me, uh, the idea of eliminating that staff and, and taking away their professionalism and knowledge of their job was not at all on the table as we discussed this or considered this. Um, our deputies are very familiar with the force reserves, as, as you saw by the charts, they do commonly respond there, 
uh, they'll occasionally patrol there. They're often sitting in the parking lots uh, doing stationary activity. Uh, we are offering out of the sheriff's office to provide full records management support with our front end uh, office staff that is familiar with the same platform as the Forest Reserve uses, including through that, Blair. And of course, the point that uh, I've made throughout, it's very important to maintain at least that full-time staff because now they can focus on all those extra duties that they provide from the ATVs, the snowmobiling, to the enforcement of ordinances, uh, the, uh, the encumbrances, is that what they're called? See, I don't even, encroachments, yes. Um, they, they get the, the time and the flexibility for their scheduling to, to take care of those tasks. And we lift the burden of uh, majority of patrol and response to uh, primary response to calls for service. Go Blair. And of course, the other point I was making when we were talking about payroll, if you maintain that part-time staff, it just reduces your savings on a sliding scale. Go ahead. And click through all that one. Listening to the concerns of uh, the Forest Reserve, completely hear them uh, but again we reiterate you keep your go right back there okay again re reiterate, reiterate and iterate you keep those those officers for all of your support uh, highly trained and skilled deputies can certainly augment your part-timers if you do decide to eliminate those positions or if you just keep a few we are here to help as we have been uh, how do we guarantee control of police operations uh, and termination of agreement if unsuccessful? And I'll show an example of an uh, intergovernmental agreement at the very end here that I would suggest that clearly lines that out. Uh, why does the sheriff want to do this? We kind of covered, I'm relatively ambivalent when it comes to it. I believe it's responsible government, it's responsible to our constituents to take a good hard look at finances and see where we can consolidate services across the county. That's my sole vested interest here. Go ahead. You can pop all these up there. Just for examples around the state, those uh, counties in northeastern Illinois, much like us, have that luxury of a tax base to provide force preserve police autonomously in their counties. Uh, other counties you see around us, DeKalb, Kendall, uh, they have no contract uh, with the force reserve. They just blanketly provide that coverage. Uh, Winnebago Sheriff actually gets paid to do so. I think it's a nominal fee of about 10,000 per year and uh, Boone Sheriff, you see about the same there as well. Vast majority downstate south of I-80 depend upon uh, state conservation police or the sheriff's office on any uh, preserved land. Go ahead. Now I get to the IGA points. Fortunately, folks, this is a shorter Ron Hain PowerPoint, not like what most people are subjected to a Judicial Public Safety Committee. This is the last slide. So clearly defined points that mean the most to all of us, uh, of course, maintains operational control of their officers under the Forest Reserve. We at the Sheriff's Office would provide that operational and financial support as requested by their admin lieutenant. Any increase in operational cost to, due to the Forest Reserve needs will be funded by the Forest Reserve. I think we could all understand that if demands and needs change, that uh, we'd have to come to the table to determine how that cost get, gets covered in the future if, uh, if some sort of operational cost increase uh, other than what we've examined here. All salaries and benefits along with discipline, termination, recruitment, and hiring will be at the sole discretion of the Forest Reserve. And of course, the preserve would maintain or should maintain their current policies and procedures with the adoption of the Sheriff's Office body-worn camera policy, uh, which will be pivotal in the near future. Uh, two different tentative proposals you could look at. A one-year agreement for operational budget sharing and the retention of all staff, including part-time, with the exception of the public safety director, basically a trial run to see how everybody feels, or an unlimited term agreement retaining none or just some of those part-timers with a minimum six month termination clause. So understanding that if we eliminated staff, any part of that staff at the Forest Reserve, it would not be fair for the Sheriff's Office to step in. Whatever Sheriff six, eight, 10 years from now comes in and says, I don't agree with this anymore and wants to eliminate it, they put a lot of weight on the Forest Reserve to go back and hire some more part-timers. Uh, but six months should give them a, a relatively decent amount of time to bring that staff back on and vice versa. We would want uh, advanced notice, especially when it comes to financial coordination, if we're uh, returning some funds over, I shouldn't say returning funds to the Forest Reserve, but if, if we uh, no longer had the weight of the Forest Reserve operational costs on our budget. So that includes, concludes my overview. You've seen I've talked a lot today and my mouth is getting dry. So time for uh, any questions that you may have. Comments, concerns?
Thank you, Sheriff Hank. No problem. I, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions and <laughs> talk uh, ensuing. So, certainly. Uh, Monica, would you like to say a few words? Sure, we put together some information. We realize that this is a difficult situation for the commission alike in terms of they're trying to be fiscally responsible and look at a variety of avenues and options. And so we want to be respectful to that process, um, but also want to make sure that you have all the proper information possible to make the best decision. So um, myself and the chief are going to kind of walk through some um, information uh, regarding our public safety department as well as the Forest Preserve D District in general. So our mission, to me, everything comes down to the mission. So the Forest Preserve District of Kane County mission is to acquire, hold, and maintain lands within Kane County that contribute to the preservation of natural and historic resources, habitats, <laughs> where are you going, Lori? Flora and fauna, and to restore, restock, protect, and preserve such lands for the education, recreation, and pleasure of all of its citizens. Now, the important factor in this mission to me is not only the public factor of this, but also the flora and the fauna. So we have um, state and federal requirements to protect our natural areas, which provide habitat for our uh, endangered plant community as well as animal communities. And so when you look at the public safety department, their mission just is a adjunct to what the agency mission is. The public safety department provides a welcome and safe family oriented environment for forest preserve district patrons, staff and employees by utilizing a community oriented philosophy. Additionally, an ethical people oriented work environment is fostered to allow our officers to enjoy their jobs, utilize their talents and respect one another and grow as professionals. So when you look at how we're structured, obviously we've got our director of public safety, we've got our sergeant, and then our full full-time uh, full officers and 12 to 15 part-timers. What's important to recognize here is this is just not about 911 calls, it's not about a patrol schedule, but we do maintain two officers uh, every day, 365 days of the year, uh, even during holidays, 7 to 3 p.m. and then 3 to 11 p.m., two officers on each shift plus a full-time sergeant. And then after hours, our chief and sergeant are always on call. So what's important here to recognize is the part-time officers or their full-time equivalent hours are utilized to fill in for the patrol as well as to take care of any special patrols. Um, we could sit here for hours and go through all of the special duties that these officers have, whether they're full-time or part-time, even the communication level. We don't, this is not done um, in a communication that's linear. So what happens is um, we have a part-time officer that's been doing our ATV training as well as our um, snowmobile training. And that's for the public through the DNR as well as for our staff. That is a part-time officer. So if you need anything relative to that, you contact that part-time officer. If you need something scheduled, you contact the sergeant. Need something more administrative, you work with the, with the chief. And so communication um, is with all of these officers at any given time. A lot of our part-time officers have been here for 10 to 27 years. These are not seasonal positions. These are part-time professional officers that either work for us part-time, work for another agency full-time, or work for another agency part-time, but they are seasoned police officers. So we wanted to do some comparisons to kind of give you an idea. I mean, we've heard about um, responsible government and being able to provide our services at the most cost-effective ways. So let's look at some other agencies. When you look at DuPage at 25,000 acres, Lake County at 31,000 acres, and even Will County at 21, almost 22,000 acres, you can see they have quite a bit more full-time officers as well as part-time. We have 23,000 acres. We have our police chief, four full-time officers, and then um, our sergeant and 12 to 15 part-time officers. So when you look at this, these are the agencies that have the same mission and the same work functions as we do. And you can see that in most cases, a lot of them have double, triple um, the, the office staff, officer staff that, that we do. So once again, um, we believe Kane County Forest Preserve District is a very high functioning, cost-effective operation. When you look at the tax dollars, per acre with these agencies compared to us. You can see DuPage is about 1160 per acre. Lake County is 803 per acre and Will County is 677 per acre. This is based on their annual budgets um, to operate their entire operation. Forest Preserve District of Kane County is 310 per acre. So very cost-effective 
very efficient use of taxpayer dollars and practical um, government operation. Now here is where we really start to see the differences between um, the Sheriff's Department as well as the Forest Preserve District. So we enforce compliance with our use ordinance. I put some of these books out for everybody if they're not familiar with them. They're the little blue books. This is what governs the public use, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do in the Forest Preserve District. And if you go through some of these from um, reports at our off-leash dog areas or fly dumping and encroachments. We work closely with the DNR for hunting violations and fishing enforcement, off-road, off, uh, illegal operation with motor vehicles, ATVs, and snowmobiles. Uh, we have quite a bit of operations within the preserves for remote planes and cars. Uh, we have parking issues all the time. People just want to drive and park wherever they want. Is this, are these things that will be, continue to be a priority if it's moved over into the sheriff's department? So um, the other thing I've mentioned before is the, um, the special enforcement when it comes to the protection of our natural areas. We work very closely with the Illinois State Nature Preserve for our ecological enforcement issues, neighbor complaints, um, and obviously safety on our three major regional trails. And... Uh, accidents and issues that do occur in the preserves. The one thing I do want to point out though is our operation is not really focused on 911 calls. We are a uh, proactive community-based public safety department that gets to know the users of the preserve, the neighbors, the um, other intergovernmental organizations that use our preserves. We're very community oriented. Then we have special details. So when I was talking about how we schedule our officers, we also schedule special duties. And so the, the patrol that we noted is a minimum. So this is where the part-timers really come into being able to fill in all of these community-based activities, whether it's working with our planning department on encroachments, we have to, um, we have to map a lot of information, prove the encroachment is on our property, communicate to the individual, giving them a certain amount of time to relieve the encroachment. And most of the time, um, unfortunately, a lot of our bordering uh, neighbors don't want to adhere to the, the requests. And so we send an officer to knock on the door to ask them to comply. And then the officer has to come back in 30 days and make sure that encroachment's been taken care of. If that isn't taken care of, then they have to go to court and make sure it's taken care of. A lot of times we can just have mediations that have to be taken place with neighbors. Again, our goal is not to give people tickets. It's to have community-based um, policing that is more about people enjoying their appropriate use of the preserved land. And some of the other things we have with our special details is gonna be all of the special events we do. We're getting ready to open up our new cross country facility mm -hmm. behind the Fox Valley Ice Arena. They'll be patrolling that. We also coordinate the large cross country meets on all of our properties. Um, we do Kane County Cougars events and traffic and all of our grand openings and we have security after hours. So when we've got either activities in the preserve or at our facilities, our officers will swing by and make sure that um, the individuals leaving the facilities are in a safe environment to get back to their vehicles. Also our high visibility patrols with uh, ATVs, bicycles, motorcycle and snowmobile um, groups. We are actually out there on our trails in our preserves um, this is not about just seeing what's going on in a parking lot. We own 23,000 acres of land that goes so far beyond the parking lot that you need to know the trails, you need to know the preserves by like the back of your hand. And again, even our part-time officers that have been all trained in the aspects of the forest preserve know these preserves. And then we have liaison groups. And so we've got natural resource management. Uh, they work with uh, the natural resource department. We have our own hunting program. We work closely with the hunters and the staff, as well as communicating to the neighbors. Uh, in our operations department, we secure areas during storms. Uh, they also communicate and take care of graffiti that takes place on a regular basis, more so than I, I care to see, but it does happen. And then um, we're lead safety related education for the public. So we have uh, trainers within our public safety operation that train the public as well as our staff on and get state certified in snowmobile safety. We do the bike safety rodeos in the neighborhoods. We have child safety presentations. We're in our schools. We do the national night out at several locations and we have personal safety training for the employees. So we've done uh, several active shooter trainings uh, at the administration building. 
we go out or, or the uh, officers go out to our operations and work with our staff to train them on how to safely, if they have to approach users in the, um, in the preserves, how to do that in a safe manner. Um, so they're not putting their own safety in jeopardy. And so our officers become our own agency trainers. And just a couple other things here. So obviously our volunteer groups are very important to us. Our Kane County Mounted Rangers are, uh, are known throughout the state, if not the nation, in terms of um, their training ability to go out and do search and rescues in our preserves. Because again, they know the preserves like the back of their hand and they work closely with uh, our public safety department. We have a li liaison within the agency, within the uh, public safety department that attends their monthly meetings. They coordinate their patrols and they do public relations along with the group and parades and grand openings. Our snowmobile safety patrol is coordinated by the public safety department and uh, our liaison will attend regular meetings and actually go out in the winter time to patrol the Great Western Trail with the group. We do this for not only visibility, but enforcement. We have uh, alcohol accidents that, that had occurred in the past, but those have uh, really gone away because of our efforts to be on the trail in the winter. We check for tags, we check for um, appropriate um, mechanics on the snowmobiles, and we just make sure that our trails are a safe place to go snowmobiling. Uh, we work closely with the DNR on uh, animal poaching, after hours uh, deer management when it comes to their program, as well as our hunting program, and the overall protection of wildlife. Other law enforcement jurisdictions, uh, obviously we, we work closely with not only the sheriff, but also the other jurisdictions throughout the county um, on any policing effort. Just some pictures here, you can, kind of, you can see how visible we are. Uh, a lot of these are our um, public safety that, um, programs that I just talked about. You can see at the bottom left, the class, that's a snowmobile certification class that our public safety department coordinates on an annual basis. So you can see our reach is pretty wide. So I think it's really important here. There's, there's not one important aspect over the other, but we are very proactive versus reactive. 911 calls are a very small part of what we do. Our police officers are state certified and receive special training in conservation and ecology from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. They're trained in risk management specific to recreation agencies. Obviously we're part of the Park District Risk Management Association that provides that, um, that our insurance base, but also a lot of our training. Our officers are present in the forest preserves not only to protect and serve, but also to enhance the visitor's experience. Um, people know that we're in the preserves and we're patrolling, therefore they feel safer. So in addition to providing a safe and welcome environment and keeping the peace, the Forest Preserve officers perform mm -hmm. vital conservation roles like checking for fishing licenses, investigating illegal hunting, and helping to protect the habitat and wildlife, including rare and endangered species. So these are preserve quality issues that affect all of Kane County residents, and they're what make the preserve safe and enjoyable. And again, this is all part of what's established in our mission. So let's look at some public surveys. Um, we do a public survey every other year. These are just the last two that we did. But in 2017, uh, we asked the question, do you feel safe while using the Forest Preserve District? 93% said yes. And in 19, it went up to 94%. I don't think there's too many other agencies that can tout a 94% satisfaction rate where people say they feel safe. And so, Looking at everything that we've tried to build and establish over the year, we, years, we've established a trust in the community with our police officers. So we're very well expect, uh, respected in the community. And the, and the things that I wanna ask are certain questions like, um, by doing this, what are we trying to improve? And when I look at the officers that are serving the community in the Forest Preserve District, we've gotten no complaints on racial discrimination, no complaints on excessive force no complaints on officers charged with any type of inappropriate activity like theft. Um, no complaints against an officer in the last 12 years that we know of. And the only reason we did 12 years is because that's as far back as we went. We've had no officer complaints, anonymous or otherwise. And even anonymous complaints have to be fully vetted and investigated. So when we look at the matter of forest preserve safety, we're a 365 day operation responsible for the protection of 23,000 acres. Whether you're 
a person, a plant, or an animal. So with full-time officers off for, for two days and without the part-time staff to cover this time, I'm not too sure how the sheriff's proposal would incorporate all of the facets of what we do. And um, seeing his proposal, his presentation today, I clearly see that he's added back in the opportunity for the part-time staff, because I don't see how any of this would really work. But um, even with that said, I see that there is a, uh, a vast difference in the approach to uh, to the policing efforts in whether you're an environmental conservation police officer or you're a um, sheriff's deputy focused on um, making sure that um, the criminal base is taken care of and crimes are at a minimum. And so, you know, when you look at some of these special patrols that we've that we do, we've talked I've talked about those already, so I'm not going to repeat it. But there's there's quite a few. And additional costs. Um, I'm trying to figure this out because it seems to me like it's a shifting of expenses from one agency to the other. And I understand clearly that we're looking at expenses for a smaller agency versus a larger um, sheriff's department. But again, I think something has to be lost in the shuffle and I believe that's going to be the service level. Payroll and collective bargaining, the force preserve at this time has no um, union affiliation. We have quite a few um, employee run committees. We engage our employees. Our employees know that at any level in the organization, you're a vital cog in the wheel. And everyone's, um, in my mind, been part of the larger plan and the larger operational focus. And as such, um, there's not been employees that have, that have tried to bring in a union. When I look at the average cost for our officers versus the sheriff's department, I'm trying to figure out what happens in three, five, or 10 years when these agreements start to expire and what the cost increases would be when you just look at the basis of a force preserve officer who makes on average 63,000 a year as compared to a sheriff's officer that makes 95,000 per year. Now, again, that's including overtime. Uh, the sheriff's officers are unionized, we are not. Um, the sheriff's officers use SLEP which is a more expensive pension plan that also um, accounts for an earlier retirement. We use IMRF and through, through that, it's a less, a less expensive plan and you have to, have to be with the agency for a longer period of time. So, and I'm not too sure how the union would look at a partially non-unionized um, police force, but you know, that's something if, if it were to be looked at later on. So just some of the oversight concerns, again, I, I see us focusing on uh, the fact that also we've been able through the years to manage our public safety department by first recruiting and hiring those individuals that we believe have the same mission and approach to our community policing uh, within our conservation areas. We then invest in these individuals, we train them and we cultivate a top-notch professional workforce that in exchange does the same thing that comes doubles back and will train our staff throughout the entire organization. Um, under the sheriff's plan, I'm not too sure um, where uh, any of the management actually falls, uh, especially with the executive director and what authority they have to even manage those individuals, do evaluations, be part of any of the hiring process um, moving forward. So uh, would the force preserve officers be subordinate to the sheriff's sergeant? Uh, lieutenant or sheriff, um, what would the chain of command actually be? I think over time, as even if our force preserve officers go over there, over time, you're going to have through attrition, um, those officers we have now leaving the organization, either through uh, retirement or, or some other means, and then we will be utilizing the sheriff's officers that are coming off of the civil service list based on the, the current operation they use. So I'm, you know, why now and what would the benefit be? I'm a goals oriented person. I've told quite a few of the commissioners just trying to figure out what is the goal or what is the improvement we're trying to uh, gather here. Um, also the public's uh, highly satisfied with the current police force and safety in the preserves. Public safety to me is integrated throughout the whole uh, organization and into each department. It's, it's a fabric that's woven together and it's been, a, uh, it's, it's been an improvement that's made in a well-oiled oiled machine at this point. Um, and it's it part of the, the public safety department is key to the entire organization as well as all of the departments feeling safe and, and garnering the training that this organization is, or this department provides.
So again, we're kind of wrapping up with what are the different roles. Um, this presentation will be sent out to everybody and you can kind of look at this. But obviously I've handed out the use ordinances, which are so critical to make sure that um, those are focused on every day. Um, we want our visitors to feel safe while they're in the preserves and welcome. They love seeing the officers out on the trails and out in the preserves. And um, we also wanna make sure that we protect our natural resources for future generations to come. And we've talked a little bit, about, I've talked already about how, how would this work? Um, I'm not too sure yet based on the presentation. And at this point, I'm gonna like, just let the chief address uh, this last slide. I'm not gonna go over everything Monica did because I think she did an excellent job of outlining all the things that we do that be beyond 911 calls. And you know, again, the sheriff's got a great department and his deputies are, are top notch. If you call 911, they will come and they will take a good report and do an investigation for your vehicle burglar or whatever. But it's all the other things that Monica articulated that make the forest preserve the forest preserve and then we're an integral part Losing those part-time officers is gonna be huge because they not only backfill uh, days off and vacations for the full-time officers, but they also participate in all the uh, specialized patrols that are, are very important. That For those of you who've been on the Great Western Trail during bicycle season, having bicycle officers down there are the only way to get down there. Those, those trails are just crowded. Um, ATVs get us back in the remote areas where the kids like to have their dope and alcohol parties and we put a quash on that. Uh, you know, the foot patrol, snowmobile patrols are, are critical to keeping that great Western trail safe, keeping the drinkers off the trail on their, on their snowmobiles. Um, and, and their familiarity of the, of the, the um, properties is, is instrumental. The one thing I, I think a lot of people when they hear part-time officers, they think of some Barney Fife that doesn't know what he's doing. And that's absolutely not true. In our case, uh, we've got a lot of retired officers who spent full careers in other police departments that bring that experience in. Uh, and, and most of our part-time officers, they just don't come and go. We've got them here 15 years, 10 years. They just love doing what, what they're doing over here. Um, the other thing that's critical to, to keeping the quality of life in the forest preserve is those use ordinances. Uh, the deputies are not going to get involved with dogs off leash or fly dumping or encroachments. It's just not going to happen. And having four officers, uh, full-time officers to try to keep up with that is, is just not a reasonable expectation. Uh, it, it's very critical we stay on top of that. And, and last, you know, you have to ask, what's broken here? I, I don't, things are going very, very smoothly in the forest preserves, very smoothly. And, you know, so I can only come down to the point of money. But, you know, some of these costs, they're really not saving the taxpayer money. They're shifting the cost to the county from the forest preserve vis-a-vis -vis the sheriff's department budgets. Gasoline doesn't go away. Vehicle maintenance doesn't go away. These things all have to be paid for, uniforms, training. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a cost savings to the taxpayer to do this. You know, when you boil it down, the only thing you're really saving is my salary and I'm going to be retired after next Wednesday. So I don't have a vested interest in keeping that, but I, I think it's, it's very important to keep this organization together for the sake of the forest preserve. Thank you. <coughs> Chief, uh, thank you, Monica. Chairman Berman, uh, Davis for the comment. Yes. Um, it, as usual, our, our director and our chief have stepped up and done a, a fine job. I, I don't know that I have much that I can really add to that, but I, I guess first I want to say thank you to Sheriff Hain. Uh, I serve on the Judicial Public Safety Committee as well and have been around long enough. I think. Uh, Farmer Kenyon, you're, you're sitting there, you have two. We've, we've known sheriffs prior to this one, and I'm happy to report that Sheriff Hain is really a, a breath of fresh air in terms of his 
willingness to work together, to collaborate, to share, even, you know, even budget dollars. I've watched them do this in, in JPS meetings and it's, it's fantastic. Um, as a guy that sat in the, you know, on this committee and chaired this committee for a number of years, it's, you're, you're far more likely to hear from me about following the money, about saving dollars, about uh, the fact that everything we do, you know, is warm and fuzzy and friendly and, and you know, people love us, but, you know, but there's a business too. So this, this may seem a little out of character for me to come at it from a, a little bit different perspective this time. Um, but, you know, while, while I've talked about there is, you know, there's a cost to doing business, um, you got to consider the dollars versus the value. You got to make sure that when you're spending the money, that there's a return on the investment. And I think that's what brings us to what the chief was talking about, what Monica was talking about, is that the public perception of the forest preserve is critical. We have a carefully crafted, cultivated image, and that's essential to what we do and who we are. And in terms of following the money, which is something I've usually preached, you know, we go out from time to time and seek the approval of the public through referendum to give us our lifeblood to, to carry out the mission, to acquire open space. And we're able to do that very successfully because of the image that we have and the popularity that we enjoy. And this is part and parcel of that. So uh, there's a lot to think about here. Uh, I think the numbers, when you fine tune them, could shrink a little bit, but... Again, a lot of thanks to Sheriff Hain for stepping up and, and making the offer and giving us something to think about. But it's working very smoothly and very well with great success. And I, I'm certainly going to keep an open mind and, and look through all of this further. But I am reluctant to move away from something that works as well as it has for so long. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I think uh, what I'd like to do is go through the public comments and uh, those that uh, want to speak and the ones that are here and the ones that have uh, written their comments. And then we'll open it up for the board to, uh, to discuss. So that's the role we'll take. And the, uh, so therefore, our first public comments uh, for those those that are uh, uh, on Zoom, is the uh, the first is uh, Drew Golias. Now you have three minutes to speak. Okay. Can, can you guys? Uh, we'll be timing you, and we'll. <laughs> cut you off. I need you to state your name and your address for the record. And then after that, we'll time you for three minutes. Excellent. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I'm Drew Golius. Uh, I'm in South Elgin, 210 Nicole Drive. Uh, so first of all, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I appreciate that. Um, I just, uh, we live in the county because uh, we just love the area. We uh, really enjoy the outdoors. We enjoy the parks. Uh, we have walked both of our children before they can speak throughout uh, for miles on these parks. And we value them. I find the proposal disappointing. I, I don't see why we would take experienced people who know the parks and who know the people and remove them when fiscally, it just doesn't seem like there's gonna be a big return on investment in that category. Um, I really appreciated some of the comments about if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, we, we love uh, the area, we love the, the parks, 
And my fear, and the reason I'm taking time to be here is I don't want to see more crime. I, I feel like we put the TVs on and it's, it's filled with it. And why do we want that near our homes? So I very much am opposed to removing uh, the workers, who, you know, the temporary or the part-timers who they've been here so long and they, they just know the areas. So I, I just wanted to uh, take a chance and uh, share that and hope it's considered. And uh, I appreciate your time and uh, I do appreciate being heard. So thank you. Thank you, Drew. Our second speak is uh, David Baker. David, are you there? See you. David Baker, give me another opportunity. No? We'll go on to Candy Jones. Hi. Uh, it says Abby on the screen. Ignore that. I'm Candy Jones. Um, I, uh, my address is Marshall Road in Hampshire. I have been a resident of Kane County for 16 years and a Kane County Mounted Ranger for 10 years. I'm also a member of the Mounted Rangers Search and Rescue Team. It is as a taxpayer, as well as a ranger, that I would like to speak for and support the Public Safety Department of the Forest Preserve District of Kane. Forest preserves everywhere are much valued open natural areas for the public to enjoy. As we have seen over the past year of COVID stay home restrictions, the forest preserves have become much used resources for our residents. On most days, forest preserves are a quiet refuge for people and wildlife alike. They are places for hiking, biking, picnicking, fishing, camping, horseback riding, and plain old lazing around. The forest preserves are also places of danger, both accidental and man-made. As a member of the, as members of the Mounted Rangers, we work as volunteers to be the eyes and ears for the forest preserve public safety. We have no police powers, but we work closely with the Forest Preserve Police to report what we encounter while patrolling the trails. We can actually go where squad cars and police ATVs don't go. Because of that, we see the other side of the issues that can and do occur in forest preserves. We know about dogs off leashes, swimmers in places where there is no swimming allowed, smash and grabs of valuables from cars in the parking areas. We know about illegal drug use. We know about homeless people camping in almost inaccessible areas. We have alerted the police officers about illegal construction dumping and forest preserves and reported injured and dead animals for removal. While under police supervision, our search and rescue team has looked for the remains of, young, of a young woman who had been missing for a year. We have looked for lost autistic children we have searched for and found suicide cases. Forest preserves can be places of great pleasure or great pain. I believe that the forest preserves in King County need their own public safety department. There needs, there does need to be a designated and specific police presence and mountain rangers too, to make the 23,000 acres it currently owns safe places for all who wish to visit. It seems impractical to think that other officers will be able to give these large spaces adequate surveillance and or a quick response time as issues in populated areas require more and more concentrated police attention. As a taxpayer, I feel that the dollars they spend on the Forest Preserve expenses, which includes the Forest Preserve Police Department, are dollars well spent and I would hope that you would listen to all the wise words as to how the many ways that the Forest Preserve Police uh, work in the Forest Preserves. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, our first uh, speaker that in-house is Anthony Konecki. Is Anthony here? The next uh, that has signed up is uh, James Glasscott. Kevin Holmes. Uh, 
I want to say thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, my name is Kevin Holmes, and uh, I'm a retired Aurora police officer and currently working at the uh, Kane County Forest Preserve Police since 2014. A um, little bit about me, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, graduated from the University of Arkansas. And um, just wanted to say that uh, um, our department is a very, very valuable police department. You know, I enjoy working here. I enjoy living here in Kane County um, under the direction of uh, Chief Jalafo. Um, he was our chief also back uh, in, uh, in Aurora. And um, um, and I think we've um, we have um, plenty of time to um, do community oriented policing in our forest preserves. Um, back in Aurora, um, I wouldn't have been able to um, um, monitor the forest preserves as much as I do now, because some nights, um, Chief Jalafa would tell you, I would get dispatched to. 20 calls and still make one or two arrests and do one or two reports. So if he would have told me, hey, Kev, I need you to monitor the forest preserves also, I would say, huh, I'll do my best, but most likely it wouldn't happen that much. Um, so uh, myself and um, the fellow officers I work with, I think we do a great job in um, doing some of these things. Um, We'll um, one of the one of the example that we that um, <clears throat> that I can give is that we'll go down to Big Rock after receiving a call that there is about a hundred swimmers there, and um, and then a lot of times after a rain we have to slide down the little muddy hill just to get to the swimmers to ask them to leave or give them a ticket, um, and most of the times they comply, um, and I think. Um, the tickets that we wrote were probably, I don't know, 25, 30% of the crime that was actually being committed of the kids jumping in the um, swimming, um, the quarry there. But, um, but what we wanted to do was keep them from coming back and jumping in that quarry to hurt themselves, you know? And um, I think, um, you know, because a lot of those people that got out of that quarry they had cuts, bruises, scratches on them, um, had been drinking. And um, we wanted to keep, keep our community safe and healthy and keep the um, Kane County from being um, sued. So uh, we did that, myself and the um, part-time and full-time officers. Um, and we, we have the time to do that. And it, it's, it's, it's not a great, amount of pay, you know, um, but a lot of us enjoy it, you know. Um, I can um, be sitting at Glenwood Park and just waiting to see who's going to come in. Or a car might come through there, and as soon as they see um, the Kane County Forest Preserve police officer, they'll just continue making a 360 circle and leave the Forest Preserve. I don't know if they just forgot something, um, don't like the police, or had other intentions, but that's what we do. And um, all right, Kevin, I'm going to shut you off. Your three minutes are up. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next is uh, Victor Moroquin. Yes. And uh, please state your name and address. Sure, my name is uh, Victor Marquin, and I recently have moved into the Oakhurst House in Aurora at the Oakhurst Forest Preserve. First of all, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Victor Marquin, as you already know. I am a part-time police officer with the Kane County Forest Preserve District. I have been here for nearly 20 years, and believe it or not, it actually went by fast. And just recently, my family and I have moved to the Oakhurst House in Aurora. It has been a great honor for me. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for giving me that opportunity to live there on site. I, will, I also would like to say that both part-time and full-time officers with the Kane County Forest Service District, we work hard on the model of Kane County, and that is to preserve the nature of Kane County. You might ask, how do we preserve the nature of Kane County? We do it by ATV patrols, 
bike patrols, snowmobile patrols, cross-country details, and many other functions that are directly assigned by the Forest Preserve District only and no one else. We do this with professionalism, courtesy, and kindness. I also would like to add that we work very closely with our volunteers as they provide key roles into the way we police our forest preserves, helping out with snowmobile patrols and bike patrols. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a family here at the Forest Preserve District of Kane County, and I humbly request that you keep the family together and that you allow us part-time and full-time to continue to address the issues and, and police our forest preserve in the unique ways that we do. Thank you and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Victor. The next speaker is James Wolzinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's James Plonzinski, 101 North Lincoln Avenue in Geneva, Illinois. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for letting me speak on this important issue. I've been a resident of Kane County for over 40 years and have enjoyed the scenic beauty and natural areas that are found in our Kane County Forest Preserves. The forest preserves are one of the greatest assets our area, in our area and provide the residents of Kane County with over 23,000 acres of preserved and protected open space. These areas are important open spaces preserved under the mission of the Forest Preserve District, which is to acquire, hold, maintain lands with King, within Kane County and contribute to the preservation of the natural and historic resources, habitats, flora and fauna, and to restore, restock, protect, and preserve such lands for the education, recreation, and pleasure of the citizens of Kane County. It is the preservation and protection of this tremendous public investment that I am concerned about. Since the establishment of the Forest Preserve Public Safety Department, their mission is to preserve and protect the nature of Kane County and to ensure a safe family environment within the preserves. This is done with dedicated trained Forest Preserve police officers who patrol the forest preserves year round on foot, bicycle, scooters, ATVs, snowmobiles, and patrol vehicles. These officers are well-versed in the conservation of the natural environment, education of, and the need, <coughs> excuse me, to relate to the importance of outdoor safety to the public. This is critical and necessary to the maintain the integrity of the public investment in these most treasured Kane County open spaces. I feel that it is with the utmost importance for the continued use of the Forest Preserve police officers as an integral part of the Forest Preserve's operations and should remain within the Forest Preserve under the control and guidance of its executive director. Thank you. Thank you, James. Next is uh, Pete Moroquin. Peter. Next is Linda Fav. Linda. Next is uh, Mary Actionslager. My name is Mary Oxenslager. My address is 5 South 747 Sugar Grove Parkway in Sugar Grove. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing us to speak. I'm really happy to be here. I've been involved with the Kane County Forest Preserve in one way or another since 1977 when I was part of a group that was working to save Nelson Lake Marsh, which is now Dick Young Forest Preserve. I mention this to illustrate that I've had extensive history in observing how the Forest Preserve functions in relation to other county agencies. One of the most difficult issues is the tension inherent in the odd arrangement of having county board members also be county Forest Preserve members. These agencies have different missions that occasionally conflict. In order for the forest preserve to remain strong and viable, it must guard its autonomy. Although I don't know him personally, I'm a big fan of the innovations and strong leadership of Ron Hay that he's provided for our county. 
I like the idea of two agencies working together when both their missions can be improved, but not at the expense of loss of autonomy. Surely these good ideas Sheriff Hain has can at least partially be realized without loss of a control of the, by the force preserve of its security department. I feel confident your executive director and the sheriff could successfully explore what is possible without the loss of forest preserve control. This has seemed kind of rushed and that may be just that I'm on the outside and I don't know, but I'd like to urge you to slow down, really analyze the options and think about the long-term impacts such as Sheriff Hain will not always be the sheriff. What problems might arise with a less cooperative person in that position? Once you give up control of a portion of your district, it may be easier or encourage future boards to give up control of the other district, other parts of your district. Once you take this uh, department out of the budget, it will be really hard to put it back in if things don't go well. Forest Preserve Police and Deputy Sheriffs really have a, a different constituency, so to speak. Although our Forest Preserve Police do respond to crimes and committed in the Forest Preserves, they're really more of a, hey, glad to see you, hope you enjoy yourself, feel safe type of police. So I ask you to keep your eye on the mission. Be a proud protector of our fantastic open space agency. When other referendums have been soundly defeated, the Kane County Forest Preserves referendums have always passed. Your constituents are telling you that they are very happy with the Forest Preserve the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Next is uh, Shauna Wyatt. Hi, my name is Shauna Wyatt. Um, I feel like I'm going to be sort of redundant with a lot of what's been said. For those of you who don't know me, and I see lots of faces that I do know, and I thank you very much for all of the board and district support over the years. Um, I got involved with county government in 1987 uh, with the Preservation Commission, then also with Farmland Protection, but really with the Forest Preserve in 1999. Mary and I and others have been co-chairs of the five successful referenda that have added, I think when we started in 99, we maybe had 8,000 acres and we're up to 23. We have, um, Mary mentioned, <clears throat> and I was also gonna mention, at times when schools failed and libraries failed and other districts, uh, taxing bodies, referenda failed, we have 100% success record. 99, we had 66%, even after the recession, during the recession, 55% in 2017, most recent, we still pass with 54% of the majority. And that is due to your stewardship and the fact that the preserves are perceived as safe and a good value. Um, I saw something on TV the other night where somebody made a mention that crime tends to be unpopular with the public. Um, the fact that we are safe is a huge, huge factor into why we continue to get the support. The taxpayers are voting with their checkbooks, that this is a taxing body that they value. This is a product that they value. I realize that you all wear two hats, as Mary alluded to. I know that you're always uh, have the, the tough dance with doing more with less. I completely support Sheriff Hain and his department and agree that it's, it's been wonderful. Um, and also Chief Jalafo in his department. My concern, like people have mentioned, is if it does get subsumed into the Sheriff's Department, they have a lot of fish to fry. And some of them obviously will be a much higher priority at any given moment. But when you um, don't have time for fly dumping or you don't have time for suspicious activity or you don't have time for kids fighting or drinking or whatever, it doesn't take much to erode the perception of safety in the forest preserve. And with social media, it takes no time at all for that to get out. And I can tell you as a 35 plus year resident of Aurora, one, two, three, Ingleside Aurora, um, 
that once the perception of safety is lost, it is very, very difficult to reclaim. We have had years of good crime numbers in Aurora. And I don't know that we're getting, we're getting the public understanding of it because it's really hard to come back from a perception of unsafety. Um, I'm afraid that we will end up with the law of unintended consequences. And I am concerned um, as a former municipal employee in Aurora, when I saw Monica's um, notes about the difference in salaries, the difference in pension plans, and the fact that one is a union versus a non-union workforce, I think the marginal difference that this would save if it did in the short term will greatly be eaten up. I mean, quickly be eaten up by those three factors. Um, so again, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Shauna. Next is uh, Mark Kosovic. Those are the written comments that need to be read. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Thank you. Gosh. I have the honor of reading the next one then. Uh, this is Mark Kosovic. And I don't have his address here. Anyway. Dear King County Board, I have served on the King County Forest Preserve Police Department for nine years as a part-time police officer. I have worked in the patrol division and have also served on the ATV patrol from Algonquin to Aurora and the snowmobile patrol from St. Charles to Burlington, Illinois. This has been the most enjoyable and rewarding job and my effort has been proportional to the forest preserves of King County and to the citizens that I serve. I also, I also have, I'm sorry. Much of that we do is community policing, education and enforcement of state law and county ordinances. We are also a strong deterrent to criminal activity in the forest reserve. There are many black back trails, footpaths and bridges in the King County Forest Preserve that only Forest Preserve officers would know about through years of experience. Citizen safety could become an issue with new officers not knowing where exactly to respond to. Please note this safety concern. I would ask that the King County Board strongly consider leaving the King County Forest Preserve Police Department as it is respectfully and sincerely Officer Mark Alexander Kosovic. Thank you, Mark. This is from uh, Brooke McDonald, President and CEO of the Conservation Foundation. So with a significant increase in forest preserve use over this past year, and the likelihood this will continue, now more than ever, we need a soft police presence in the preserves to enhance the visitor experience and keep everyone safe and informed. Forest Preserve Police know the preserve as well. Thus, they can respond efficiently and provide visitor services beyond just enforcing the rules as they understand the, preserve, the preserve user community. Thank you, Brooke McDonald. And this is from Kimberly Hancock from um, Birdie Cake Drive in St. Charles. It says to the uh, King County Forest Preserve Police, please read this loud at the meeting. It has been my privilege to work closely with the King County Forest Preserve officers while being a King County Mounted Ranger volunteer. Our organization volunteers for the Forest Preserve by riding our horses in the preserves and reporting any problems or concerns to the King County Forest Preserve officers. There have been numerous, numerous incidents where the mounted volunteers contact the Forest Preserve police officers and requested their assistance in the Forest Preserve. One incident in particular involved a secluded campsite located off the trail of most pedestrians, but accessible to horses. While on the trail, several riders, including myself, came upon a campsite what looks to be abandoned at the moment. 
The camp was not within the Paul Wolf campground. It was located near the creek. It was obvious someone had been living at the site for some time. If this camp was a tent, cooler, fire pit, axe, and a children's Disney hat, we immediately contacted the Forest Preserve Police, and an officer arrived a minute later. We led him to where the site was located. The officer dismantled the camp, confiscated the axe, and requested we visit the site often while riding in the Forest Preserve to make sure it continued to be abandoned. I would hope that in the future, the police presence in the Forest Preserve remain as vigilant as they are at this date. Present in the parking lots only will not deter problems that occur in the wooded areas of the Forest Preserve. We need the officers to always be able to go into the parks and assist with incidents. It is my opinion that the Kane County Forest Preserve officers are vigilant in keeping the Forest Preserve safe and a value asset to our county. Kimberly Hancock. Thank you, Kimberly. That's all I have in the comments. So we'll open it up to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, Fries has a comment. Yes, Mr. Fries. Um, I'd like to start out with a question first and then some comments, but uh, I'd like to ask Monica Myers um, some history. When, when was our department, internal department formed and for what reason was it formed? I don't have that date. Uh, I've been here since uh, 2004 and it's, it was established uh, prior to that. I could find that information and let you know, but it was, it was formed for the uh, protection uh, and um, policing of the Forest Preserve District Mission and its use ordinances. So it's been around, it's safe to say, probably well over 20 years. Uh, yes. And probably it was, was formed for the reason that the uh, workload got, I'm, I'm assuming here, but the workload got to the point where it was needed. Um, so yeah, you know, the savings are very attractive that we heard about. And uh, I'm sure Sheriff Hain would do a great job. Um, but what I don't want to get into is a, a cycle of, uh, you know, depending on who's sheriff over the years, a cycle of uh, disbanding and then reconstituting to the department, depending on the, uh, the commitment we get from the sheriff uh, that happens to be in office at the time. Um, I will say, you know, I, I apologize to all the, the members of the force, the, if you're somewhat scared by this uh, question, but um, it was really simply uh, uh, an effort by uh, Mr. Brown, one of our newer members to, uh, ask a question and, and look for savings uh, with the transition with our chief retiring. So, you know, I commend Mr. Brown for bringing this up. That's the only reason we're talking about it. Uh, but uh, personally, at this point, hearing the, the two very good PowerPoints and thanking the sheriff for his research into the subject, I, I will be supporting keeping the situation the way it currently is. Thank you, Drew. Any other comments? Sure. Yes, Mr. Brown. Thank you. And thank you, Drew, for that compliment. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, to the citizen or the officers here that were speaking tonight, um, yeah, I certainly wasn't looking to eliminate anybody's job when I brought this up, when I talked to the sheriff about this. It was simply a matter of could the sheriff's department do what the Forest, Pre Forest Preserves Police Department does and could we save money doing it? And that's that's how we got where we're at now. Um, certainly, there's some very compelling arguments um, on both sides, and even with the idea of keeping the the um, all the part-time officers intact, there could still be a savings. So the question would just really come down to: Is there enough of a savings um, to be willing to make those changes and possibly sacrifice some of the work that the uh, that the that the police division currently does um monica gave a great presentation and if nothing else comes out of this today i'm very glad that we had this conversation because it educated me on some of what the forest preserve does and i certainly would look forward to getting this um presentation sent to us by email so that when i talk to other constituents I can say, let me send this to you, and this will explain why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so I, you know, thank you for that, Monica. And 
I never, you know, a couple of times it was mentioned, you know, what's broken? Why are we going to do this? I, I never thought anything was broken. It's just looking at being, as, as the sheriff said on his very last slide, I thought a couple of very powerful words were responsible government. And that's what I think we've been elected to do, to be responsible people representing the government or representing the constituents on the government's behalf. So that's, that's how I think we got to where we're at today. Um, I don't know that I would really support making a change at this point because I think some of what uh, Monica has brought forward and the chief and others have brought forward are very, very compelling arguments. And what Mr. Fraz just said that, you know, when we do end up with another police chief, would we have someone that's equally as aggressive and, and willing to do what uh, Sheriff Haynes is, is uh, willing to do? So I'll open the floor back up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I think you're, you're right in saying it's a, it was an eye opener for a lot of us as to what the duties of the Park uh, Police are. So that uh, I think it was very good from that standpoint. Other comments? Any, Mr. Tepe. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm one of the new members of the board, not only the uh, Kane County Board, but also the Forest Preserve Board. And can you hear me now? Ah. So I'd like to share with you just a few of my thoughts because I've been thinking about this for the past two or three days, particularly after discussions with Mr. Kenyon, <laughs> my, uh, my learned friend over there. Several things have impressed me about Kane County. One is the bipartisanship of this board, okay? That every member on this board forgets about party. They're always trying to do what's best for Kane County or what's best for the Forest Preserve. It's just been so impressive to be part of a member of that kind of body. I feel the same way about all the employees that I see um, and all the employees that are involved and the cooperation. When as a newbie, we went through our orientation with the Forest Preserve and had the individual managers put on their presentations, they were excited about their positions. They were excited about their jobs. They were talking about what they were doing, you know, and that is so rewarding to see. And when you have an organization like that, when you have incentives coming up from below, you get a much better organization, okay? If this were to succeed, everything that was presented here as a negative would have to be presented as a positive. In, in my mind, the kinds of things that I would hope to have seen if this would do, be succeed is to say, we can make this work, we will have more money, and we will be able to do this with it. Okay, and it's for that reason that I just don't see this succeeding at this time. So um, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to be a member of this and with all of the excitement, and I think we should uh, uh, probably stay the way we are right now. Thank you, Vern. Thank you. Any other? Uh... Mr. Chair? Yes, I'm sorry, Jen. Mr. Chairman, I'm not on the committee, but I've been part of the discussion and, and uh, uh, certainly have been thinking about this for weeks since the topic was introduced. And the, the, the thing that makes it unique is that the topic would have never been introduced had we not had a uh, uh, wonderfully creative and cooperative sheriff who, who answered a question by trying to find a solution. Um, today's presentations wouldn't have occurred had not he made that presentation, but done it in a very articulate manner. And frankly, that, that, that Monica laid forward some, some matters that, that were very important in the, in the consideration of what, what we ought to do and how we ought to do it. Um, I, these conversations, when you contemplate change are never comfortable because change is just not an easy thing to talk about. And we're going to have, we're not doing our jobs in either of our two capacities here as elected officials. If we don't 
start having these conversations on a regular basis because there's no budget at the county and no budget at the forest reserve, no part of that process that's going to get easier over the next over the next few years. So as, as difficult and sometimes awkward as these conversations are, we need to, we need to force ourselves to do it. We also need to to take every reasonable opportunity uh, at making absolutely certain that we're doing that we're that we're not spending money that we don't have to spend. That being said, I have many times in the times that I've been on the board said that we're not elected to be merely bean counters, but we're stewards. We're supposed to be making wise decisions on behalf of the taxpayer dollars that, that are paid with uh, you know, great difficulty and sacrifice by our constituents. And the way I read, hearing, having heard the presentations today and given it some thought is that we're gonna keep having these conversations uh, more and more and I can't, but in this particular instance, I think a wise use of our resources is to uh, stay as we are. And tomorrow we'll have a new topic that will be as difficult and uh, have as much money involved. But uh, so we need to keep having the conversations, but having had this one, I feel comfortable with things as they are and we'll support that. Thank you, John. I feel 100% <laughs> as you that we need to have these conversations and hopefully we're going to have many more to make sure that we're doing the best we are doing, can do. Chairman. Well, everything starts with a, a question, but it, it, it comes up a lot of conversation to come to the end. Yes, Ms. Yeah. Keels. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think I just by waiting till is typical awaiting till everyone on the board who I greatly admire has spoken. I really don't have to say anything because the, the, it, the insight of my fellow board members really comes through. I think they've covered just about everything. What I would like to do is thank uh, um, Chief Jalafo right off the bat for uh, the service he's provided. I think as Monica told me earlier today, I think uh, he deserves to be celebrated for what he's done over the years here. Um, for his long service and the, uh, the force is, the police force, the, our police force is uh, a direct relation to what he has done as well as the executive director. Um, uh, I'd like to thank my fellow board members too, um, who have, well, I guess I did it with a first statement, this, the insight, I think that the, it's really important that we have these kind of discussions and, and, and thoroughly vet them. And I'm absolutely delighted with the conversation we've had today and the way it's gone. Um, I, I do commend uh, Sheriff Ron Hain, uh, who has stepped forward and uh, offered the, this great service. And I hope that in the future, we can uh, work with Sheriff Hain and uh, make the, uh, maybe uh, in, cooper in a cooperative manner, uh, save money. But I think the biggest slide that, that Monica showed was that we are spending $300 per acre compared to the next one was almost double that or more than double that. So we're, we're saving the money that, or we're spending the money that we have responsibly and we're providing a service that people are very happy with. And I thank you all for participating. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. This is Commissioner Strathman. I think that this has been an excellent discussion today. And I think that the one word that I have not heard uh, about the Forest Preserve Police Department is ambassadorship. And that's how I think of that force. Whenever I've been in the uh, Forest Preserve, and years ago I was a docent for the Forest Preserve, I think of them as a people who represent the Forest Preserve District to the people who are using the Forest Preserve. And I think that um, with that in mind, I also am in favor of keeping the status quo the way it is. Thank you. Mr. Chairman Bates here, please. Yes. Uh, just, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I wanna thank Sheriff Hain and Director Myers for shedding light on this, on this proposal. Um, I want to 
Um, I want to say that the current Kane County Forest P Preserve Police Department is here to protect our unique natural resources. They have the special training in conservation and ecology to prevent actions that might harm our natural resources. And so therefore, I want to say um, thank you to the, to the current Kane County Forest Preserve Police. I want to say please remember that responsible government is not only about saving money, it's also about giving our constituents the very best services possible. So I would like to say, please keep the Forest Preserve Police just the way it is. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Payton. Mr. Kenyon. Mr. Chair Gums. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Kenyon. Let, let Mr. Gums go first. All right. Right. Thank you, Mr. Kenyon. Um, I just would like to say that um, this presentation was excellent. I've gotten a lot of phone calls over the last couple of days, done a lot of thinking about this. I applaud Sheriff Hain for his proposal. Um, and I, I am in support of keeping the, the Forest Preserve Police the way it is. Um, I see their duties as deputies and Forest Preserve Police completely, completely different. So um, I'm in favor of keeping what we have now. Thank you, Mr. Kenyon. My name is Mike Kenyon. And I've been around a long time. Our, our farm is surrounded by forest preserves and we depend on the forest reserve police to keep that clear. We depend on the county sheriff for good policing. I can remember once we, somebody came and they wanted us, we had a farm on the edge of South Elgin and they wanted us, just saw this farm and they went in to sight a rifle. And this is in the edge of South Elgin. This is a long time ago, Chief. You, you probably were in high school, but um, <laughs> I made a call. And there were three county cars there within 15 minutes. And they, they took care of it. So we've depended on our sheriff and our, <clears throat> and our force. Pardon me. <clears throat> force, we, there's no coffee here. That's what's wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> the force reserve police. Um, over the years, I, I feel like it's been, a, it's been a great privilege to belong to this. I was part of a state organization, the Farm Bureau. No county is like Kane County. They don't get along anywhere else. People fight with each other and we work together. So I hope we can keep working together. And like Barbara said, don't fix what ain't broke, but it's it's a good thing. And these presentations were really invaluable. And although they took a little bit of angst, didn't they, Monica? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've known Monica a long time. She came as a young lady to the city of Elgin as a parks and recreation. She's the best director in the state. Yeah. She's built a team of the best people to run it, and like he said, like Vern said, they're happy to be working with each other. So I'm happy to support you, your forces are, and thank the sheriff for his generous thoughts. Thank you, Michael. You know, it's times like this, it, it uh, does bring out the best in us. So Mr. Good for that performance. Yes. Over here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, right. I'm sorry, Bill. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. I am current, I'm not on this committee as well, but I just want to say a few words and just thank everybody for speaking. It was good to see some familiar faces. I've um, been involved with the Forest Preserve and the county for 20 years now and uh, um, have enjoyed the Forest Preserves even before I was a commissioner. Um, I'm a avid outdoor person. You can't keep me in the house for too long. So I would take my dog and walk uh, down the Great Western Trail. And, and that actually, uh, about 15 years ago, the Great Western Trail wasn't quite used the way it is today because of COVID, which is really good to see. There's a lot more people out there. But I've encountered the, um, the snowmobiles uh, that our conservation officers would uh, have in the winter. And or I, I uh, come in contact with them on their bicycles. There was always, Monica said something really interesting. Um, they have more of a conservation 
appearance when you run into the Forest Preserve Police and you feel, you feel more relaxed and it's a better atmosphere. It's more like just enjoy, relax and have a good time. Um, so I'm happy to see that most of our conversation today is going in the direction of keeping them here. And um, Sheriff Hain, I do appreciate everything you do. You are just an awesome sheriff, but I think this is the right direction to go in. And uh, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Bob. Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to say that initially I was excited about the possibility of the sheriff helping out to uh, patrol the preserves. I know he would do, he and his department would do a great job as our chief has and the, the current Forest Preserve Police we have. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to a number of people on the board, uh, Mr. Kenyon, Mr. Brown, uh, talked to the sheriff. This morning I talked to Monica for over 20 minutes. And what I've realized here is, yeah, we do have to look at dollars and cents and we're gonna have some financial concerns down the road. But a lot of times when you buy something or you purchase something, it's more about the value than it is the price. And I think what I was taught by these people is that there's a real value here we have, and you can't really put a price on that or try to cut your costs. So I would like to ask Mr. Chairman, if you would consider uh, taking a consensus uh, from this finance committee uh, to stay with the current King County Forest Preserve Police Force that we have, and that we um, move on to other topics. And lastly, before I close, I'd just like to thank Sheriff Hain. You know, he is constantly trying to find ways to save our taxpayers money and to do things more efficiently. And once again, I, I think his ideas were very good, but I do think the value here is to stay uh, pat with what we have. And I agree with everyone else's comments. So I would ask maybe that we do a consensus um, from this committee. And if we have the consensus to stay with the Forest Preserve Police as is, I think we can move on to other topics. All right. Thanks, Bill. I think uh, we've demonstrated a, a consensus uh, today, but I think the question would be then if there is any of the committee that is not uh, supportive of, uh, or <laughs> it is supportive of us going further with this question. Well, hearing none, I'd say we have a consensus, uh, so we can move on. Everybody, thank the chief and thank Monica and thank all you for speaking. And uh, it really was a great discussion. Do we have need for a closed session? We do not. To the bid. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, the renewal of the agreement, yeah. Yeah, we have a presentation and approval of our intergovernmental agreement, renewal with Kane County Division of Transportation for the sub-licensing use of the Cartograph Asset Management Software. Leonard, so moves. They have a second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Would you like to have? Ken, are you on the line? I'm here. Yes. Okay. Why don't you give us uh, some background real quick? Yes. Uh, happy Chip and Dip Day to everybody. Um, before you, <laughs> before you have a intergovernmental agreement with KDOT that we are renewing, we we have been working with them the past three years with the Cartograph program, which is the asset management software that we're using to track vehicles and uh, other improvements that we have, um, accessories that we own, uh, maintenance of different facilities, those kind of things. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive software program. Uh, we do have a sub lease with them. So we are paying a portion of the licensees that we have uh, in 2021, that amount will be $21,743 and some cents. In 2022, the fee would be $22,395 and 71 cents. And then in 2023, $23,067 and 58 cents. So we're looking to get approval to move forward with this intergovernmental agreement 
as well as uh, be coming back to you for uh, those financial resources uh, in the fiscal years to come. Very good. Any questions, discussion? I, I don't recall who made the motion or do you have that? It was Leonard and then Davis. All right, thank you very much. No other discussion? Do we have a roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Berman? Yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Ford? Yes. Roz? Roz, yes. Iqbal? Iqbal, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Strathman? Strathman, yes. Teppi? Teppi, yes. That's approved. Very good. We have no reason for a closed session. <clears throat> Communications? Do have any communications? I don't have any. Support uh, your Forest Preserve District Foundation. <laughs> yes. Buy more plants. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tell them, Mavis. Yep. You're trying to confuse me, I guess. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we, I have no comments. We've, uh, it's been a, a, a very informative uh, committee meeting today. Motion for adjournment. So Davis moved. moves to adjourn. Second. Oh, all those in favor say aye. Aye.